1 John 5 7, the greatest Trinitarian forgery in history. I am Simon Brown, presenting my own research. There are Trinitarians who believe the Bible translations like the King James Bible regarding 1 John 5 7 proves the Trinity. This is because the Trinitarian Bible translations like the King James Bible reads For there are three that bear record in heaven the Father, the Word and the Holy Ghost and these three are one. We also have Trinitarians who have done some research as in the article here by David W. Daniels who states 1 John 5 7 belongs in the King James Bible and was preserved by faithful Christians, but the passage was removed from many Greek manuscripts because of the problems it seemed to cause. Let's again examine the biblical facts and see if that Trinitarian claim is true. Let's see what is actually written in the oldest manuscripts because surely they would reveal the truth as they are the literal biblical facts. Let's start and look at 1 John 5 7. It is certainly a good thing in these last days to translate the oldest manuscripts from the oldest Greek texts. As Saint Paul taught, but examine everything carefully, hold fast to that which is good. And by doing so, we find what are biased translations and forgeries. And this is what me, an ordinary man off the street, would like to demonstrate to you. This is my own translation of 1 John 5 5 to 8 from one of the oldest complete Bibles known as the Codex Sinaiticus. And we kick off with 1 John 5 5. Who now is the overcoming? the world, if not the believing, that Jesus is the Son of the God. Firstly, did you notice nothing is said there by John about one must believe Jesus is God or a trinity, but only believe Jesus is the Son of the God. One John 5, 6, this is the having come by water and blood and Jesus Christ not by the water only but by the water and the water and the spirit is the testifying because the spirit is ho he to the truth 1 John 5 7 for the three are these that testify 1 John 5, 8, 3, the spirit, and the water, and the blood. Did you notice the main verse, 1 John 5, 7, that so many Trinitarians use to prove that God is free in one, supporting the Catholic Trinity doctrine in 1 John 5, 7, that we did not see the Trinitarian formula. What we instead saw was that the whole verse is missing. But this biblical fact and shocking forgery gets worse by the second. Because I will now show you this great Trinitarian forgery is not just missing from the Codex Sinaiticus, but instead the Trinitarian formula is completely missing from all the oldest manuscripts. What this proves is that many Trinitarians believe what they read without doing any research on what they read. As we have seen, many have no idea with what's missing from the oldest manuscripts. And what about Trinitarians like David W. Daniels? If he is correct, why don't other Trinitarian scholars agree with him, but instead what we see is that Trinitarians like David W. Daniels contradict other Bible scholars 
who are Trinitarians also. Committed super Trinitarian and Greek scholar, theologian Dr. James White, the director of Alpha and Omega Ministries, admits that 1 John 5 7 is a forgery. What Trinitarian should we believe? In this case, James White is right. Are there other Trinitarians who agree with Dr. James White? There certainly are. Let's have a look at what other Trinitarians say. Pulpit Commentary also states, 1 John 5 7 It will be assumed here, without discussion, that the remainder of this verse and the first clause of verse 8 are spurious, words which are not contained in a single Greek uncile manuscript, nor in a single Greek cursive earlier than the 14th century, the two which contain the passage being evidently translated from the Vulgate, nor are quoted by a single Greek father during the whole of the Trinitarian controversy, nor are found in any authority until late in the 5th century, cannot be genuine. Jameson Fawcett Brown Bible Commentary states The only Greek manuscripts in any form which support the words, in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one, and there are three that bear witness in earth, are the Montfortianus of Dublin, copied evidently from the modern Latin Vulgate, the Ravianus, copied from the Complutensian Polyglot, a manuscript at Naples, with the words added in the margin by a recent hand. Ottobonianus, 298, of the 15th century, the Greek of which is a mere translation of the accompanying Latin. All the old versions omit the words. The oldest manuscripts of the Vulgate omit them. It was therefore first written as a marginal comment to complete the sense of the text, and then, as early at least as the 8th century, was introduced into the text of the Latin Vulgate. The testimony, however, could only be born on earth to men, not in heaven. The marginal comment, therefore, that inserted in heaven, was inappropriate. John never uses the Father and the Word as correlates, but, like other New Testament writers, associates the Son with the Father, and always refers the Word to God as its correlate, not the Father. Vigilius, at the end of the 5th century, is the first who quotes the disputed words as in the text. But no Greek manuscript earlier than the 15th is extant with them. The term Trinity occurs first in the 3rd century in Tertullian, against Praxis. Let's now go to the website of Bible Research, Textual Criticism. 1 John 5, 7-8, the so-called Johannine comma, also called the comma Johannium, is a sequence of extra words which appear in 1 John 5. 7 to 8 in some early printed editions of the Greek New Testament. In these editions the verses appear thus. We put brackets around the extra words. The King James Version, which was based upon these editions, gives the following translation. For there are three that bear accord, in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one, and there are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit and the water, and the blood, and these three agree in one. These extra words are generally absent from the Greek manuscripts. In fact, they only appear in the text of four late medieval manuscripts. They seem to have originated as a marginal note added to certain Latin manuscripts during the Middle Ages, which was eventually incorporated into the text of most of the later Vulgate manuscripts. In the Clementine edition of the Vulgate the verses were printed thus. From the Vulgate, then, it seems that the comma was translated into Greek and inserted into some printed editions of the Greek text, and in a handful of late Greek manuscripts, all scholars consider it to be spurious, and it is not included in modern critical editions of the Greek text, or in the English versions based upon them. For example, the English Standard Version reads, For there are three that testify, the spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree.
we give below the comments of Dr. Bruce M. Metzger on 1 John 5, 7 8, from his book, A Textual Commentary on the Greek New Testament, 2nd ed., Stuttgart, 1993. After Marta Rhodes, the Textus Receptus adds the following Greek letter, new Greek letter, tau oron, patik, logos, ka Greek letter, tau janima, ka oti Greek letter, amikran, tres Greek letter, nuisi, eight ka tres es in Greek letter, amikran, Marta Rhodes, Greek letter, new Greek letter, tau Greek letter, gamma. That these words are spurious and have no right to stand in the New Testament is certain in the light of the following considerations. One, the passage is absent from every known Greek manuscript except eight, and these contain the passage in what appears to be a translation from a late recension of the Latin Vulgate. Four of the eight manuscripts contain the passage as a variant reading written in the margin as a later addition to the manuscript. The eight manuscripts are as follows. 61. Codex Montfortianus, dating from the early 16th century. 88. A variant reading in a 16th century hand. Added to the 14th century Codex Regius of Naples, 221, a variant reading added to the 10th century manuscript in the Bodleian Library at Oxford, 429, a variant reading added to a 16th century manuscript at Wolfenbüttel, 629, a 14th or 15th century manuscript in the Vatican, 636, a variant reading added to a 16th century manuscript at Naples. 918, a 16th century manuscript at the Escorial, Spain, 2318, an 18th century manuscript, influenced by the Clementine Vulgate, at Bucharest, Romania. 2. The passage is quoted by none of the Greek fathers, who, had they known it, would most certainly have employed it in the Trinitarian controversies, Sibelian and Arian. Its first appearance in Greek is in a Greek version of the Latin Acts of the Lateran Council in 1215. 3. The passage is absent from the manuscripts of all ancient versions Syriac, Coptic, Armenian, Ethiopic, Arabic, Slavonic, except the Latin, and it is not found uh, in the Old Latin in its early form, Tertullian, Cyprian, Augustine, or in the Vulgate, b, as issued by Jerome. Codex Fuldensis, copied AD 541-46, and Codex Amiatinus, copied before AD 716, or, c, as revised by Alcuin, first hand of Codex Valisolianus, 9th century. The earliest instance of the passage being quoted as a part of the actual text of the epistle is in a 4th century Latin treatise entitled Liber Apologeticus, chapter 4 attributed either to the Spanish heretic Brazilian, died about 385, or to his follower Bishop Instantius. Apparently the gloss arose when the original passage was understood to symbolize the Trinity, through the mention of three witnesses, the Spirit, the Water, and the Blood, an interpretation that may have been written first as a marginal note that afterwards found its way into the text. In the 5th century the gloss was quoted by Latin fathers in North Africa and Italy as part of the text of the epistle, and from the 6th century onwards it is found more and more frequently in manuscripts of the Old Latin and of the Vulgate. In these various witnesses the wording of the passage differs in several particulars, for examples of other intrusions into the Latin text of 1 John, c 2.17, 4.3, 5.6, and 20. B. Internal Probabilities 1. As regards transcriptional probability, if the passage were original, no good reason can be found to account for its omission, either accidentally or intentionally, by copyists of hundreds of Greek manuscripts, and by translators of ancient versions. 2. As regards intrinsic probability, the passage makes an awkward break in the sense for the story of how the spurious words came to be included in the Textus Receptus, see any critical commentary on 1 John, or Metzger, the text of the New Testament, pages 101f, cf also Ezri Abbott, I, John V7 and Luther's German Bible, in the authorship of the Fourth Gospel and other critical essays, Boston, 1888, pages 458-463.
It is also interesting to see how Bible scholars today agree with the research by one of the history's greatest scientists, Sir Isaac Newton. Newton became an Arian around 1672. First let us explain the Arian doctrine. It is a Christian heresy first proposed early in the 4th century by the Alexandrian Arius which, based on a study of the Bible, stated the belief that Jesus was more than man, but less than God. In other words Arians do not believe in the identification of God, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Ghost, so they do not believe in the doctrine of the Trinity. Newton came to believe that the Roman Catholic Church was misguided in its interpretation of Christianity and had returned to idolatry. Although he partly approved of the Protestant Reformation, he felt it had not gone nearly far enough to return Christianity to its original state. Now if Newton did not believe in the Trinity, he had to consider the first epistle of John chapter 2, verse 7, which reads, in the King James Version, for there are three that bear accord in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Now Newton, who felt that his mission was more to study religion than science, certainly did not stop at reading the King James Version of the Bible, but rather read all original versions he could, learning the necessary ancient languages. He discovered that the final phrase in these three R1 was not present in any Greek version that he studied. Newton came to the conclusion that it was a deliberate addition to the text to provide justification for the doctrine of the Trinity. He wrote down a list of 12 reasons why he was an Arian. Now of course it was not acceptable for people to hold views considered heresy by the church. So after Newton's death this list, and his other theological writings, were marked not fit to be printed. They were stored and were not read by anyone until Keynes acquired them in 1936. Whom do Trinitarians believe? Here is the shocking truth. If Trinitarians do not believe God or his son or Bible scholars who teach the Trinity is false, then who do they believe if they cannot believe their own Trinitarian Bible scholars? Find out the shocking truth on my link below. There you will also find Simon's conclusion explaining what St. John meant in 1 John 5. 6 to 9, where we find St. John is teaching about the testimony concerning the Son of God, and nothing about a trinity. According to what Jesus taught, Trinitarians will not be saved, because they do not believe what Jesus taught, that his Father God, is the only one true God, and believing that, is eternal life. Now, the shocking truth is, this Trinitarian forgery is in line with countless other Trinitarian forgeries. And just like another Trinitarian forgery in Revelation 1.11, where a whole verse, the Alpha and the Omega, is yet again missing from all of the oldest manuscripts, and again was found to be added to the title of Jesus, to deceive people into believing Jesus is the same one true God. The shocking fact is we very easily find countless deliberate forgeries, distortions and mistranslations which in return proves the desperation by some to prove that Jesus is his own God or God and Jesus are a trinity which instead disproves and destroys the Trinity's own credibility. The only scripture proving the Trinity is a forgery. 1 John 5-7, the greatest Trinitarian forgery in history.